I think that what's v- extremely valuable in in seeing in seeing that perspective and having this long view of history is realizing that you know this this project has been going on for a very long time um and and there has been uh, again resistance and as you mentioned at the very beginning there are still very contemporary examples of indigenous resistance to colonialism to the state and you know you are of, of course you know having written about this but you also have written about anti-fascism um anti-capitalism you've been involved in these uh, this these movements if i could say it that way uh to to whatever degree for however many years at this point um and and and, and before, i think it's before we started recording but i was sort of discussing the there's sort of a eurocentric uh or or western centric i mean i say that correctly a uh, view of of anarchism so when we talk about anti-fascism or anarchism it's often through a western uh, theory or western lens um but i i think that there's so much that can be learned from indigenous struggles indigenous forms of organization um, in fighting oppressive power structures. Um, and like you had mentioned, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think you've done a great job in trying to blend and meld those together, understanding that there are contradictions between both of them, but we can probably find common ground in understanding that, um, in your work, I mean, what have you, uh, what kind of themes and what, what ways have you tried to address maybe that Western, uh, bias in anarchism and trying to meld that with maybe more indigenous perspectives. Uh, if, if you had any ideas or thoughts on that, that would be great. Well, I think anarchism, I mean, anarchism is a European uh, ideology. It, it arose in Europe and it arose in response to the rise of capitalism. And it was part of the, the, the kind of socialist uh, revolutionary left movement that arose, you know, by the 1800s in, and into the early 1900s, and it makes sense to me because this is a movement. It's being organized by the working class, primarily, and they're trying to deal with this capital, a new form of economic uh, power, capitalism. So that's to me. That's where I mean. That's to me where the anarchist movement really has its birth. It's in, it's in the proletariat fighting against the rise of the capitalist state. The same as the communist movement and the socialist movement. And I think that to to, to be like, oh well, anarchism should also be like indigenous kind of thing. I don't think that's really necessary. I be, but I do believe that indigenous peoples, because now we're living under the state, because we're colonized, uh, we're living under the state. So anarchism is a very useful tool in terms of understanding the modern state and capitalism. Um, so I, 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 I'm involved in both like uh, uh, indigenous anti-colonial resistance and also the anarchist anti-capitalist resistance. And I see, I see um, the importance of both. And I, I try to build, uh, you know, links between them because I think indigenous people can learn a lot from anarchism about the state because we didn't have the state. It's not part of our tradition, the centralized authority and power. We never had to deal with this. So anarchism can give us a better understanding of the state and how to resist it and how to, you know, how it works, how the mechanisms of the state and whatnot. Anarchists in living in North America, I think, can learn a lot from indigenous people because indigenous people show another way of life is possible outside of the state because we existed for thousands and thousands of years without a state uh, before colonization and indigenous culture because of its connection to the natural world you know that again it can give another view of another way of life another way of looking at the world we live in that's not just based on capitalism or or even communism and you know building better factories so the proletariat can run society i mean indigenous Indigenous culture would be contrary to that because it's about, you know, living within the natural world, not occupying it and, ta- you know, taking as many resources as you can and whatnot. So I think both movements can learn from one another in the current context, in the world, the society that we live in now. So I think both are important. Um, and, uh, I mean, today, like in Canada, I mean, Indigenous peoples are often at the forefront of uh, of anti-colonial str- and even anti-capitalist struggles, even though you know a lot of indigenous people aren't anti-capitalist, they're engaging in struggles that limit the ability of corporations to come in and take resources, for example. So indigenous people can have, a, in Canada, because we're a bigger percent of, percentage of the population than in the United States, and because of the location of a lot of indigenous communities, indigenous peoples in Canada can have a large impact on the politics of Canada. And 
So it, it's an important movement, and I think it's important for anarchists to understand the history of colonialism and anti-colonial resistance. And that will enable all of our movements to, you know, work, have better solidarity together once we understand each other's politics better. I think that would be a big help. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a big help, yeah. Do you sense that that's happening at all, though? That there is this uh, solidarity? Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah. I've seen it since because I've been involved since the late 1980s in in these kinds of movements. So I've seen a big progression over the last, you know, a few decades, two or three decades. Because in the late, late, late 1980s in Vancouver, I mean, you, you you'd ask a, a, a leftist or even an anarchist like, whose ter- whose indigenous territory are we on? And nobody really knew. And it was never common at rallies to have a speaker or a welcoming speaker from the local indigenous nation come to the rally to open it up and to, you know, to welcome people and stuff like that. That never, ever happened. And it was only in the 90s that that began to happen in Oka, which was a conflict, a confrontation between the Mohawk Nation primarily and uh, the Canadian state, police and military. It was a major standoff. It lasted like 77 days in the summer of 1990. Now, after that, you had a big change. And in a lot of cities, especially in Vancouver, because that's where I was living, there was a big push to understand the, whose traditional territory you're on, to acknowledge that it, at, at rallies and events. So then it became very common that you have someone from one of the local indigenous nations come, open up the event and whatnot. So that's been a big change. I think there's been a much more... Uh, I think anti-colonial consciousness has uh, increased a lot since the 1990s, since the early 1990s. And I think today when you see, when you see the solidarity with Unistaten, I think, you know, that's the result of all that, uh, that, that type of work, anti-colonial resistance work, especially in Canada. I think anarchists are a lot more on top of anti-colonial resistance, uh, solidarity type of stuff. Um, just because of the importance of indigenous peoples in Canada, uh, the impact that indigenous peoples have on the society today. And I think it's different in the U.S. because native people are a much smaller percentage of the population, and, you're, and you also have a much larger uh, black and Latino populations. And I think a lot of efforts of the U.S. Uh, Euro left settlers or whatever are often focused more on the black and Latino uh, community organizing and stuff like that, just because they're much such a much more significant political force in the United States than Indigenous peoples are. So in Canada, there's it's a different kind of context here. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, anti-colonial consciousness has has grown uh, a lot more since the ni- early 1990s. Yeah. <laughs>